In this video, let's take a look at the first problem on the Unit 6 code. And in this problem, we'll get some practice uh, implementing binomial regression on some real data. And the nice thing about this data, uh, as compared to the data that we looked at in that previous short little lesson, is that the response here is binomial and not just Bernoulli. So there will be um, a total of six possible failures of something. And uh, so these things are these O-rings from the Challenger disaster and a total of six O-rings could fail and so we wanted to see in these different locations how many out of six failed. So take a second and pause the video to get a, a description of this data but basically the things that we're measuring are ambient temperature so that's a continuous variable that will be our predictor and this damage variable will be the number of O-rings that fail out of six. So in this case, what we typically call a success under the binomial framework is actually a failure of this part. All right, so as always, read in the data. Uh, if you have trouble with the Faraway package, don't worry, I'll upload this um, O-rings data. That way you can read it in uh, from a web link. And the first thing that we do uh, going along with the example in our textbook, so our textbook analyzes this data also. So going along with that, um, we create a plot of the temperature along the x-axis against the proportion of O-rings that have failed. So I calculate the proportion of O-rings that failed here. We know the total number that can possibly fail is 6. So on each of our measurements we have some number between 0 and 6 that actually do fail. And we get a plot that looks something like this. So temperature against proportion. Notice that in most cases for higher temperatures you have zero failures. So it looks like there's an issue with lower temperatures, right? As the temperature gets lower, it seems like we have some, some more failures to deal with. That seems to be the trend. Now, of course, if you decided to uh, fit just simple linear regression to this data, things would not look so great. Um, you would get a line that looks something like this. And, you know, that's problematic because, well, it doesn't seem to fit very well and it's not capturing the real, the real structure here. So that's why binomial regression would be a, a better option. Um, the response is binomial and if we want to try to predict the proportion of failures here, which is like a probability, the probability of failure, then, uh, you know, we should go with the binomial regression line. So in part B, I ask you to use the, the GLM function and uh, fit the logit model. And so I suggested this in the last video, but the GLM function works in a similar way to the LM function. You'll have a response uh, tilde predictors, and you'll have to specify in this case, since we have a, a binomial that's not just a Bernoulli, you'll have to specify um, you know, two things. One, one way that you can do it is specify the number of successes and the number of failures. And you can, you can do that in a matrix. So if we look down below here at the uh, running the GLM function, notice that I've taken the C bind, which will bind two columns together and it binds the column together of the number of failures of the O-ring and then the number of non-failures, right? Six minus the number of failures will tell you how many uh, didn't fail. So that's your response, right? You're putting in that matrix as the response, those two columns binded together. And then the predictor is temperature, the continuous uh, variable. You're telling R what, what data frame to read this from and then you are using the family equals binomial, and that will tell R to use the logit link function. So just as with the LM function, the summary of whatever you named your GLM object will give you uh, a summary of, uh, of the model. Some things will be a bit different, but a lot of things will be the same. One of the key things that I want us to think about here is this estimate column. This will give you the beta naught and the beta one. And you can interpret those in terms of the log odds 
that we talked about in a previous video. And so, of course, if you want to interpret thing in terms of things in terms of the odds rather than the log odds, you'd have to exponentiate those things. In part C, here's some code to uh, plot the uh, basically the curve that you get from uh, binomial regression over the data. And here's the curve that you get. Um, obviously, it doesn't fit perfectly, right? But the suggestion here is that this is sort of a true curve that the, the limited data that we have were generated from. So it seems to do a lot better than, uh, you know, the simple linear regression line, but again, it's not perfect. All right, so the next thing I want to look at is actually thinking about the interpretation of these uh, estimates. So let's check the interpretation of beta 1 hat. So that's the slope parameter in the, the estimate of the slope parameter in the linear predictor. So I'll, I want to do this by creating two new temperature values, one at 45 and one at 46. And let's calculate the odds of failure at 45 and 46 degrees. And then think about what's the ratio of these two odds. Well, I think there's some theoretical work that we can do first to understand what we should get as the ratio, and then we'll do it uh, coded in R and make sure that we get it for this particular example. So I did a little derivation here to think about what the odds ratio would look like. So just some notation. I have O of x plus 1. This tells me the odds uh, for uh, some temperature value x plus one degree and then in the denominator is just the odds of the, that original temperature value so ultimately we're going to plug in uh, 46 and 45 for x plus one and, and x respectively but what is that equal to well we know that the log of the odds is equal to our linear predictor so the log of the odds will be equal to this beta naught plus beta one times x plus 1. So of course if we just want the odds we're gonna have to exponentiate so we get uh, e raised to the linear predictor with x plus 1 plugged in on the top and just x plugged in on the bottom. Alright so if we wanted to simplify this a little bit of course we can distribute the beta through to each one of these terms so that's all that I do here is uh, distribute through And then notice that if you have e raised to some sum, you can multiply e raised to each one of those terms independently. And so I just split up uh, e raised to the beta naught plus beta 1x up top, and then I separate out e raised to the beta 1, that extra term. And then notice you have cancellation, right? You have an e raised to the beta naught plus beta 1x in the denominator and it cancels with the one in the numerator leaving you just e raised to the slope term. So that tells you that the odds ratio if you increase the predictor by one unit just gives you uh, e raised to that slope parameter. And of course if you want to talk in terms of estimates you can estimate the odds ratio and you can plug in the particular values that I gave and you'll get E raised to the estimate of your slope. Alright, so let's look and see how we might do this in R. Well, we've done similar things uh, for linear regression, so let's try to see how it's done for binomial regression. You can create uh, a new data point for temperature at 45 degrees, make it a data frame, call it new data, and then this log odds 1 will just basically give you the predicted value of the probability, uh, sorry, in this case it would be the log of the odds of failure at 45 degrees. So that's what you should get here. And then if you just want the odds, of course you have to exponentiate. Same thing for 46 degrees, so I create uh, a new data frame with the temperature value 46. I calculate the log odds uh, here. So this is basically predicting 
the log odds for this new temperature value using the estimated coefficients, and then I calculate just the odds by exponentiating. So this ratio down here, right, this odds 2 over odds 1 is just the ratio that we calculated uh, theoretically up top. So that means the output of what I have highlighted here, odds 2 over odds 1, should be equal to E raised to the slope uh, estimate. And we see that that's exactly what we get as output. Right? This here is output for what I have highlighted, and then this down below is the output for that piece there. All right, if we go back up to our summary of the model, I want to say just a little bit about some of these other columns. The meaning of these columns will be basically the same thing as the meaning for, uh, for simple linear regression. So the standard error is the same thing. It tells us the standard deviation of the estimator of the intercept and the slope. It's just that these things are calculated in a different way. Right Before we were using least squares and we were under the assumption of normal response and error terms. Here we don't have those assumptions so we have to use maximum likelihood estimation theory and there's some theory, it's asymptotic theory, and it tells you what the distribution of the maximum likelihood estimator will be and from that distribution you have the variance, the standard deviation, and so you get the standard errors. So that's where these values come from. I won't test you on formulas for those things. I may ask graduate students on a future homework something about um, maximum likelihood theory, but I won't expect you, especially undergraduates, to be responsible for any of those formulas on the exam. So notice the next column, instead of a t-value, which is usually what we see for linear regression models, here we see a z-value, and that's a direct result of the fact that um, the maximum likelihood estimator is asymptotically normal. So this is an asymptotic um, result and we're getting Z statistics instead of T statistics, and then we're getting p-values here. So the main thing that I want you to be responsible for in terms of inference is to be able to decide whether something in a GLM is statistically significant, and of course that's looking at these p-values here. So you should know the null hypothesis associated with this p-value and also with this p-value. It's the same as it is for uh, standard linear regression, which means that the null is beta naught is equal to zero, and that p-value bears on that evidence. The alternative is that it's not equal to zero. And same here, the null is that beta one is equal to zero. The alternative is that it's not zero, and both of these p-values are small, which means we reject the null. In a future lesson, we'll learn about how to interpret the null deviance and the residual deviance, and we'll probably also say something about the AIC, uh, but for now, uh, don't worry about interpreting these things. Just as a, a hint looking forward, uh, these deviances will correspond roughly to the residual sum of squares in the uh, standard regression model. Okay, so part E of this question, I ask you to compute the confidence intervals by hand, and what I mean by that is don't use a built-in R function, but just compute them based on um, formulas for confidence intervals that we've seen before. So here, all that I'm asking us to do is think about the normal theory that we know about from our prereq course, and that tells us we should have a point estimate uh, minus a critical value times the standard error. So this standard error I'm getting from the table above, right, that 3.2 or so, which comes from up here. And then on the uh, upper bound of the interval, we should have, again, the estimate plus the critical value uh, times the standard error again. So do the same thing for the slope coefficient. 
and you get uh, these values down here. So notice that neither of these cover zero, right? This confidence interval does not cover zero, it's to the right of zero. And this confidence interval does not cover zero, it's to the left. And that should correspond directly back to the hypothesis test above, right? These don't cover zero. And these tests having to do with the parameter being equal to zero uh, are statistically significant. So they both tell you the same thing. And of course, that's not an accident. So I also ask you to compute the confidence intervals using a built-in R function, and the conf int function will allow you to do that. So here you should see very similar results to what's up top, right? They're off by just a little bit, and the reason for that is that, uh, I describe it here a little bit, there are sl two slightly different methods for computing confidence intervals for the, these GLMs, and I don't want to get into the details for the purposes of this course, but I give you a link here to to check out if you're interested in those differences. So for part G, all that I ask is that you uh, predict the probability of failure at a temperature of 45 degrees. So above, we created this new data data frame that just had the temperature of 45 degrees. And this predict.glm function will allow you to make predictions using the model based on some new data frame and you're looking for a type of response which will give you um, this should give you the probability of failure at that temperature and so if you think about this this probability is really high and this temperature of 45 degrees is pretty low so if you go back up to your plot here you should notice temperature of about 45 degrees. The predicted value is given as you know somewhere around here, and so that is consistent with what we have as our you know a visualization of our model, and it suggests that as the temperature gets lower, we have a much higher probability of of damage and of failure. All right, so I hope that gives you a good sense of uh, understanding about this problem and uh, hopefully it, it allows you to, to finish this assignment uh, quicker than you would have otherwise.